I did realize that once I started creating my user interface, I was like, oh, I need this and I need this, or I don't need this and I don't need that. So it did help me to kind of pull it together a bit. Yeah. And that, you know, and that's pretty expected. Like I would, I would really expect like uh, where you guys are at, like if you need to uh, for your, for the final project, like I, and in fact, I would recommend it. You know, you're trying to figure out how you want to organize things. Definitely back of the hand napkin it, but I also wouldn't spend a ton of time uh, making it all electronic and mm-hmm. fancy kind of a thing. But uh, like, uh, like some people have done, they actually use uh, MySQL Workbench, like the graphical editor tool to actually build their database, which is fine as well. Yeah, that's what I did. Yeah, I don't care how you do it. Like, you don't have to, like, I'm going to show you, I'm going to write code from scratch. Um, I don't care how you do it as long, like, yeah, you, you basically just provide your deliverables and you're good. Um, you know, because I think they're both viable. And I think especially as you're learning, um, I do think there's, uh, I think, um, I do think it's faster to, uh, for me, because I don't like clicking through the UI. Um, and so for me, it's much faster to just uh, freehand it like I'm, like I'm going to show you today. Um, and just so you know, this is actually a real project that I am working on. Now, the only caveat is I actually already have this built um, with Postgres because that's my, I, I prefer to use it, but this is actually a project that I'm doing. Um, um, I actually just switched jobs, but I'm still consulting um, for my previous work. And this is uh, one of those things that, uh, that I just need to get done. Uh, Cause I promised it before I got a new job and, and anyway, so I'm, I'm working on it. So just, you know, this is actually a real project. So it's going to be built to spec, so to speak. Um, which is really cool. And I think it's going to, I think you guys are going to like just seeing it. Um, it it will go pretty quick, but I think it's going to, I think it'll help you because a, I think, uh, I think the cons conceptually, I mean, we've all been to school, we've all seen courses. Um, we all know what credit types are. So, so anyways, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, we are going to build a course catalog, um, database, um, essentially, um, and in fact, what I need to do is I need to create a new database. And I don't know if I can do this here. Create database. Let's try it. Yeah. So uh, let's just create one real quick. And while you're doing that, can you explain the whole unique thing? Because unique is throwing me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to go over because we're going to use it like uh, for, for real here in just a minute. So um, let's do this. Let's go MySQL dash U. I can't remember what I used as my password. My SQL dash. My SQL. Hey, what do you know? Okay. Create database. Um, we'll just call it course catalog. Um, and then I'm going to grant all privileges on course catalog dot star to anywhere. All right, so I should be able to, and just to check, I'm gonna make sure I can log in here. School rocks, we're gonna use course catalog. All right, yep, we've got it, okay. So now I'm just gonna refresh here and we should be able to see that. There it is. All right, so we are gonna use course catalog. I'm gonna run that so we can just make sure it's all there. All right, so um, this is gonna be a course catalog, meaning basically what this is gonna fuel. And I'm hoping to actually get this done before the end of the class, because I'm really trying to get it done this week. Um, but what this is going to power is a Flask web application. Um, Flask is a Python web framework. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to power a website that's going to be a browsable course catalog. Um, and we're air gapping it away from our student information system. 
Um, that's why we're building a separate database because technically we could just pull straight from it, but we try not to do that as much as possible. Um, so basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna be a, a warehouse to hold all of our courses, our, co our current course catalogs. Um, um, so that way you can browse just like we've seen on a BYU Idaho's website. Like, so if we go to uh, BYU Idaho course catalog, um, this has kind of been my inspiration, so to speak. Um, if we go to courses, there's a nice little place where you can go and as a student, you can click on different uh, courses, see the description, see prerequisites, all that kind of stuff. And so that's essentially what this is going to be. It's going to be, uh, it's going to fuel this website. So that's kind of what the database is for. Um, and we're just going to dive right in. And the way that I like to start is I always like to start broad and then narrow down uh, because everything's a hierarchy, right? Um, and so the first thing I'm going to start with is a school. Um, and this is kind of where you got to be thinking about business logic just a little bit um, because really depending on how you're planning on building this or what your organ is, your, your actual business logic, you know, the way you do things, it will actually play a part in this, um, which we'll talk in a minute. But one of the things that's important to keep in mind while we do this is that um, we organize a lot of our courses by school um, because we actually have multiple schools. Unlike BYU-Idaho, where we're kind of just like one institution, we have multiple different schools and they all have different set of course um courses however they can share courses so it's going to be a little tricky because we're going to have one course catalog um, that can kind of be used at, at various schools so let's uh let's get going here um i am still in uh postgres mode so apologies if i do something kind of weird number primary key I don't want to, and and uh, I can't remember. I, I know Oracle. It's a uh, is it Int in MySQL? Yes. Okay. Perfect. But yeah, I get that's the one that always throws me off just a little bit. Okay, so it's an Int. Uh, we're gonna have a school name. Um, and so I see that you put the comma at the beginning of the next line. I see that often, like the commas won't be at the end of the sentence, they'll be at the beginning. Is that just kind of a preference thing? Yeah, so it, it is just preference because, um, and, and here's what's funny is depending on the language you're using, um, some people, I even myself differ between putting it at the end and putting it at the beginning. For some reason, when I write SQL, um, I like it formatted like this, just because everything lines up nice. And I think it's because oh, okay. with uh, databases, you work with tables so much that mm -hmm. you like things to kind of, because some people get really picky about, you know, like this stuff lining up in like perfect rows, columns. Um, but I always try to at least do this because, uh, so basically whatever it is that's separating it space. And so it just kind of lines up nice. You'll see me do the same thing with select statements, um, okay. so on and so forth. Well, thank you for the added insight. Yeah, um, no problem. Sorry, I'm gonna try to get caught up here because I wanna get to where we have constraints at least. <laughs> so basically every school is going to have a uh, school, a name, an abbreviation, a number. And you'll notice that on some of these I'm putting not null. Um, and that basically, that in itself is a constraint, meaning that like, oh, we're not gonna have a school without a name. Right. And, and those are nice to build in because then you have certain expectations when you write select statements like, um, oh, like I can find a school by a name or a number and I'm not going to get null values for those kind of a thing. So it's really important uh, to, to put constraints on your database. Um, but here's where we're really going to start constraining some things. So the first constraint that I always build is the primary key. So I'm going to say, I'm going to build a constraint. It's going to be a primary key. And that primary key is going to be on school ID. Now, this is where we're going to start getting into some of these new constraints. And specifically, like you asked for, we're going to build a unique constraint. And I'm not sure, I'll be honest, if I can do this in my SQL. So we're just going to, I'm just going to real quick run this. Um, Oh, and we already defined primary key. I, like I said, I am still in a 
Postgres mode. Let's try this. Okay, so that does work. So let's drop this table school. Um, all right, so the, the reason why we're going to put a unique constraint on name is because I don't want two schools with the same name. And so what we're saying is, hey, name has to be unique. And I'll show you a demo of that here in just a second. And I'm also going to put the same constraint on number. Right, because we don't want any schools to have the same number. And I'm also going to put that same constraint on a unique constraint on the abbreviation. So, I mean, you can go as crazy as you want with these, but really the more you have that makes sense obviously you don't want any that don't make sense but but the more you have that makes sense the the better it's going to be um, and that's because we're going to keep our data more clean so i'm going to go ahead and run this and we create it so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to real quick do an insert into school um, we want to do name abbreviation number and active we're going to say values, and I'm going to say, uh, we'll use a local one here. We're going to say Star Valley High School. Its abbreviation is SVHS. Its number, which I did it a var char because a lot of them possibly could have a, a num, a alpha character in it, but that's its number, and it is active. So I'm going to insert that row in there. And then we can select it. Let's just select everything from school. All right, so there's our info. Now I'm gonna try and insert the same record again, and it should throw an error. And you'll notice that it says duplicate entry for Star Valley High School for key school, school UK1. Now if we look at this, oh, we have this constraint, meaning I can't have the same school name. So let's, uh, let's just add, let's say we change the school. We're gonna, instead of Star Valley High School, we're gonna do Star Valley Middle School. And let's say that someone forgets to change the abbreviation and the number. Oh, now it's saying duplicate entry for 12.20256. Oh, I forgot to change my number. So let's, uh, let's fix that. Now let's try to insert it again. Oh, now I have duplicate SVHS abbreviation, SVMS. And now, because everything is now unique that we had, it now fits our constraints, and we can now have both of them. So does that make sense for the unique constraint? Yeah. So do we need to have constraints built into our final? Not necessarily, no. It's not going to be the uh, end of the world. Um, I mean, I would like to, it would be nice to see one or two, maybe. Just okay to kind of but i do understand so, that this is at the end of the the term so if it's not in there it's not going to be a big deal well so, and i've already done all my create tables so can you add them in afterwards yes so you can with the alter statement right yep and that's what i'm just about to show you here okay. in just a second so before you go any farther i have a question about the um the int okay so like today when I was um, going through, like working on my tables and, and also reading the chapter for this week, um, I saw that a somewhere there was a lot of, they were using small int instead of int for like the IDs. And I was just wondering what's the, uh, what, like what's the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the uh, difference? What's the reasoning? Yeah, the reasoning, like what's what's the advantage? That's the yeah. word I'm looking for. Yeah, advantage so so that. yeah, so small int, and let me actually see if I can find you a, a web page here, because that'll be the best way. MySQL int versus small int. Let's see if we can. Uh, well, we'll just look at this one. It's not necessarily MySQL, but it should be about the same. But really, it's about data storage, and because really, when you're designing a database, it's really about what do I need that still will fit everything, right? Because when you're talking about billions of rows, space matters very quickly. Um, and so when we're looking at uh, what we want, um, you know, it, it for especially for uh, um, IDs, because like most of the time we can kind of guesstimate on, 
on uh, how many rows we might have over the next, like, let's say 20 years, so to speak. Um, and on a often, or you'll, let's say like, hey, I just, you know, making choices. So when we deal with an int, you'll notice that an integer takes up four bytes of storage. Um, a small int only takes up two bytes. But, you know, the difference is, is an int can hold more possible values. So when we're talking about ID, ID columns, you know, we can hold uh, 2 million, uh, 147, 483, uh, 647, um, you know, values where a small int can't hold that many. So really it just depends on how many records you're going to need, if that makes sense. Does, does that help answer your question? Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. In fact, most of the bigger ones, they'll actually use big int or they'll actually use a GUID, which is a alphanumeric um, because it can just hold so many more possible values. Mm. The the other thing that I noticed was um, I was trying to make a field a boolean, and every time I typed in boolean, it changed it to tiny int. Yeah, and uh, the, some yeah, depending on what ID you're using and which database, some don't actually support a boolean. And in fact, I actually preference um, if I'm having it power a web application or pretty much anything. I, I'll be honest. I, I actually use a tiny int and I just set it to be one or zero. Um, so instead of having it be true or false, I just do one zero. Um, this and, was in, this was in the, uh, the, what's it called? Workbench. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head if MySQL supports bool. So does the, so does using a var car uh, with a, uh, uh, a, a value of one for a Y and flag uh, it is so that takes up more space than a tiny int using just a one and a zero. Correct. Yep. Oh, that's okay. Hey, yep. I, I, ha I have one question for you back on your insert. Okay. And real quick, uh, MySQL does not have a built in Boolean type. However, it uses tiny int one instead. Um, which is basically, like I said, that, that's pretty common practice. And a lot of that's because um, while we're on the topic, uh, you know, when you power a website, you, you want to avoid translation, right? And, and whenever, if, if you've ever used HTML to build like a, a checkbox, they're all built on one, like one means checked, zero means off. So, so that's kind of like a, a lot of why that practice is pretty normal. All right, what was your question? Okay, so so on the insert, let, let's say for example, uh, we we re, we absolutely needed to reinsert that record. I didn't see the book talk about it, but I understand in MySQL there is an insert ignore into, and it would override the error. Is that accurate? You know, I'm. I'll be honest. I've never used it. Okay. Um, I do know that there's ways you can do like an upsert. Okay. And, and maybe that's what it is, um, where basically you say insert, if it already exists, update the information. Mm -hmm. But okay. if you have this constraint on it, it can exist twice. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, and so now what I did is you'll notice I took off the constraint for abbreviation temporarily, because what we're going to do is we're going to add it. Um, you can do it with an alter table. Um, so we're going to alter table school, add... Constraint school UK2 or UK3, sorry. Unique um, abbreviation. Uh, oh, I, I must, I dropped it. There we go. So there we go. So there's another way to add a constraint after the fact. Now, obviously, if you have data that violates that constraint, you would have to fix that prior. Um, prior to running this. You can't add that if something violates it, it'll throw an error and tell you. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is, um, is that we there's, there's kind of two ways to add, uh, especially like unique constraints and that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing that's uh, in this week is, is uh, indexes. Um, and indexes are handy. So you'll notice that I kind of threw these unique keys in here. 
Um, and depending on the database, it can automatically create, uh, like I know Postgres, I'm not 100% sure on MySQL. I'm betting it does. Um, when you create a unique constraint, it automatically creates a unique index. Um, and the difference, like, why do you care? Why do people care is an index will, um, and I kind of touched on this in the announcement, I mean, in case you haven't seen it, an index will help our database be faster. So you can imagine, let's say we had millions of schools um, and we want to find one based on the number. Well, in this case, our number is Varchar, but the thing about computers is they're pretty smart and they know how to sort things. Um, and so just like if you think back to like how libraries used to index books and all the libraries had their own little special indexing system and one was always better than the other one. Well, every database engine has this magical sauce that's coveted secrets about how they index their databases um, and algorithms that they use to quickly find records. And in this case, like, so back to our scenario, we want to find this school based on a number. We're looking for one specific school um, out of a million rows. Well, if we create an index, so let's pretend that this row doesn't, ex this uh, constraint doesn't exist right now. Um, if we wanted to find number, um, this row is not currently indexed. So essentially, uh, for the sake, because uh, I don't know exactly how this happens, but for the sake of showing how it works, um, it's going to start at the very top of the table and it's going to say, okay, row one, does it equal, does the number equal what I'm looking for? Nope. Row two, does the number equal what I'm looking for? Nope. And it's going to go all the way through the whole table, right? Um, because what if there's two schools that have the same number? Because right now we don't have a unique constraint on it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build an index. So uh, let's uh, say uh, create index uh, school index one. Um, and we're going to say unique. And we're going to say it is on school. And we're going to do it on number. Let's see, how did I do this? Create, oh, sorry. Did this backwards. Create unique index. So you'll notice that this one's a little different. Um, we, uh, of course, I always drop that table and forget to recreate it, so there we go. All right, so you'll notice that we created our unique index and we gave it a name and we're saying this is on school number. So it's kind of like what we have before. The only difference is, is this time we're creating an index explicitly, um, but a unique index. So the same concept applies that number is now unique. But the important thing about this being an index in our scenario is now the, the, the database engine has now indexed a school column number. Um, and so what it can do now is let's say I'm looking for number 52032. It's going to, instead of starting at row one and going all the way down, it already has algorithms in place to where it can say, hey, instead of starting at row one, I'm going to skip right to where I have indexed that, uh, the you know, because the number is 5201, it, it sorted it alphabetically and numerically. Um, so it can jump straight to where five starts. So, you know, you can imagine how much time that saves. Think about finding uh, people based on their name. If your name is Zeke, it doesn't start at the top. It starts at the end, um, essentially. So it can skip tons and tons of rows um, to, uh, to, to find what it needs faster. And so when you hear about database tuning and database performance, really what they're talking about is, um, cause there's, there's lots of people that that's their whole job is they go look at other people's databases and they in, improve performance on them. Um, and so they'll, they'll go through and look and say, Hey, you know, I can index this one column and save you an hour on your query. And, and just, you know, like this has happened even in, in some of the little organizations I've worked in, there's one where we uh, log every uh, URL that um, gets pinged on our network. And you can imagine that's pretty big. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, 5,000 people and we're basically logging all their internet traffic. So lots of records. Um, and, you know, if we want to say, hey, we want to know everybody who went to this website, 
um, or all the devices, I should say, if we want to know all the devices that went to this website, we can index um, certain columns and make our query um, significantly faster. In fact, there was a time we went from, I think, 10 hours to four minutes with one index. So, you know, they make a big difference. Um, so let's see. Yep. So there's our, our create unique index. Basically, that's what we did is we said, hey, database engine, I want you to organize this like in 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 the back end because like we don't see anything change on our end um, besides performance. But I want you to take and and organize this however you see fit. And really all it does is it says it tabulates everything and says like, hey, you know, the Z letter starts on row five million, you know. And so I can skip all the way to 5 million if what I'm looking for starts with a Z for that column. Um, and so you can do that. Now, obviously, you don't want to index everything, but you want to index things that, um, that you're going to use frequently. So something like a school number, school name, school abbreviation, you know, I'm going to have those in almost every query that I write. So if we can index those, it's going to be more performant. All right. Um, so let's... Uh, Let's leave that for now, um, but let's keep going. Um, actually, you know, let's put this back because I do believe, um, I can't imagine that this doesn't make a unique index in the process of making a unique constraint. I could be wrong. I know that, uh, that uh, Postgres does, but, um, and I like to do that just because it's clean. It's all in one statement, so to speak. All right. Um, so there's school table. Now let's do another one. So we're going to say, let me get rid of this drop table statement. We're going to say create table credit type. Basically, we want to be able to store certain types of credit. You know, like, is it math credit? Is it science credit? That kind of thing. I need to not be so picky about spacing. So I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance because um, I'm trying to hurry. Things are not going to be as pretty. They're just going to be done. So, I mean, I'll tab, but nothing too crazy. Let's give them 30 characters for their credit type. And I'm going to put a not null constraint on that one because we don't want there to be one without a name because that's kind of all there is. So credit type PK. Oh, we already have a primary key. Let's do a unique constraint. We don't want two credits with the same name, right? That would never be a good idea. It just doesn't make sense. And that's kind of how you know if you should put a unique constraint on something. It's like, oh, there should never be two of these. So we put a unique constraint on it. Um, because people aren't trustworthy. That's what you'll find is uh, when you're dealing with data, people are far from trustworthy and it's not, not their fault. It's Sometimes it's their fault. If you've ever had to deal with like data entry people, you know, yeah, it's their fault, but you know it's just one of those things that if you can save them hassle it's well worth the effort so now what i'm doing is i'm building the actual catalog so this is kind of a, a big portion of the meat of this um that's going to house like uh, groups of courses um to to make up a catalog now one thing you're going to notice is i'm going to put school id here and we're going to build a foreign key on that but um, I'm not going to make it not null because maybe a course catalog is assigned to a certain school, but maybe it's not. So that's why it's optional. It's going to be attached, but it's going to be an optional attachment. We're going to let you name your uh, course catalogs up to 60 characters, and that one is going to be not null. Um, we're going to have a start date and an end date because maybe we want a, um, maybe we want a catalog for every year. Now, this is where it gets interesting. End date, you can choose to have it not null or you can choose to leave it nullable. Um, Cause let's say we have a course catalog, we don't know when it's gonna end. Now, every business is a little different. You can save a lot of logic on the back end um, by simply saying, hey, you know, we don't know when this is gonna end, um, but just put it like in the year 3099 or whatever, you know, the year 5000. Um, because then it's not our problem, right? Or you can choose to leave a blank and say, hey, we don't know when this is going to end. Uh, but then they have to kind of compensate for it with uh, 
you know, oh, yeah, I want all the course catalogs that are active between the start date, uh, between today. Um, so is the today between the start date and end date? Well, you can't do that if end date is null. So um, in this case, I'm actually going to put not null. I'm just going to say, hey, you can predate this because I'm expecting that their course catalogs will be one year at a time. Um, is it active? We're going to make that one nice and easy. And you'll notice that I'm putting an int there. Technically, I could put a tiny int would probably be better. Um, published, because these are just flags, right? Yes or no? One, if it's yes, two, if it's no. And technically we could add a, let's do this. Let's say default is one for these. There we go. That means if I, I don't have to include it on my insert statement, it'll just be there. All right, now let's build our constraint. So the first thing we're gonna need is we wanna tie this to our school table. Even though it's optional, we still want it. So like they can't tie to a school that doesn't exist. So we're gonna say, hey, school ID is going to point to school, school ID. So basically what this is saying is that school ID, so this column has to be a value that exists here. If we tried to put a school ID for a course catalog that doesn't exist, it's going to not let us. It's gonna throw that, that error on that constraint. All right, and we only want one name for a catalog. So we're gonna say unique name. All right, I forgot to run this one, so let's make sure this works. Let's make sure that this works. There we go. So now we have a course catalog object that we can now put things into. Um, now what we're gonna do is we are going to build a course table. Course ID, and this one really is the meat of this whole process um, because this is where our course's data is gonna sit, primary key. We're gonna say uh, catalog ID, every course belongs to a catalog. And we're gonna put that one not null, meaning that you can't have a course that's not assigned to a catalog. But you can have a course that is assigned to a school or a course that's not assigned to a school. Because let's say it's a district master kind of a course. We, we maybe don't want that assigned to a school because it is assigned to multiple. Um, so that's kind of why we're gonna leave that one null nullable. Every course has a number and it's a var char, just like CIT 225. We're gonna give them credit 20 characters and we're gonna make that not null and everything's gonna to have to have a name and we're gonna give them 60 characters for that. And that also is gonna be not null. Um, we're gonna give, uh, in my database, like, because we're K-12, uh, it's gonna have a state code. Um, and that state code is uh, basically uh, basically a code that's assigned by the state to, to that. But we're gonna let that be nullable. How many credits is it worth? Um, and since that can be multiple, like it can be 0 0.125 credits, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna make that a float. Um, and then we need a credit type. What type of credit is this? So we're gonna do credit type ID, integer, and then we're gonna have our description, which is a, a character large object. MySQL does character large object, I'm guessing. Okay, let's uh, put our constraint on here. And the first thing we need is our uh, course foreign key to catalog all right we got that one next thing we want to do is another foreign key to school i usually just like to go in the order that the columns show up Oh, and I made a boo-boo here. We needed this to be course catalog. 
And then finally, we need another foreign key for our credit type. And it references credit type ID, sorry, credit type, credit type ID. Whew, that was a lot. And we're gonna add a couple, you can see how like when you're building something, eventually it ends up being mostly constraints, almost more than columns. Um, we're gonna build a unique constraint on our course number. We're gonna let you name the course the same name, um, but you have to have a different number. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, we don't want this because what if, because this is gonna hold all courses, right? What if we have a different course the same course exists in two catalogs with some minor changes. Maybe we change a course description. We don't want to lose that course. We just want to um, have it be unique. So really what we want is we want a unique course number per catalog, which is doable. So we're going to make a combination where we're going to say, hey, look, your number can exist twice as long as it's not in the same catalog ID. Does that make sense to everybody? That's that. That's almost like this course this year. You know, two twenty five. The content changed, but in previous catalogs, which will still reference on Canvas for the students that have already taken it, it'll show the old content. Exactly, because like really, the description might have changed, right? Because we switched from Oracle to MySQL. So you want, but we don't want to lose those historical records. So we don't just update the course description. We want to create a whole new course, even though it's going to have the same number. But uh, so it's going to have the same number, which needs to exist twice. But we don't want CIT 225 listed within the same catalog year. So yeah, you're exactly right. Like CIT 225 is a prime example of, of, of why we would uh, A, want to, to build our course this way, but also why we need to include a combination unique constraint um, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to build another version of 225. Does that create, is that like similar to like a concatenation where it, it's going to create the index and then take the number in the catalog and merge them together? Or how does that? Yeah, you can think of it exactly like that. In okay. fact, that's kind of how I envision it. Like, okay, if I were to say number plus catalog in a string, they have to be unique. And, and that's pretty, that's essentially how it works. Um, and let's see, I had something wrong here. Let's run that again. What did it say? Uh, constraint, course, foreign key, outline 10. Oh, clob. Okay, so apparently this clob, I don't know what the, I don't know what the MySQL version of that is. MySQL club. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Do I have to give it a uh, here? Let's let's do this. Maybe it just is expecting a size. Let's say two hundred fifty-five characters. No. How about tiny text? Try tiny text. Two. There we go. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I'm used to, uh, in fact, I'm going to try this because that's two up to 255 characters. Perfect. Yeah. And I'm probably going to give them a little bit more than that. Um, not that this is actually real, but I want this to be as real as possible here. So uh, I'm going to give them just a full text. Perfect. Yep. That's how I had it originally in my Postgres. I just didn't know if my SQL tends to be a little bit more Oracle and they use a clob instead so perfect thank you all right so there's our course now what we need to do is cool all right so so that is uh the bulk of it what time are we at okay we're at 550 okay so that is a really quick 
um, hopefully that helped with some of these constraints and, and the indexes. Um, you'll read a lot about the different uh, constraints and indexes probably if you haven't already. Um, but the nice thing is, is uh, once you see how they work, really you're just building rules. So like in this case, we have not null constraints. We have unique constraints. Um, we have foreign key constraints, which basically means that they have to reference another one, um, so on and so forth. Um, so I'm probably gonna leave it uh, here for this time. Does anyone have any questions? Because um, we are gonna come back to this. Um, it may not be in MySQL from this point on because uh, once I get to the point, basically my hope is, um, because I, I have the Postgres done, I'm hoping to have some data in those tables and also being able to show it on the web application um, for next week. Um, so you can kind of see it in action. Cause I think that's uh, for me anyways, you know, databases are cool and all, um, but really what's cool is when you actually get to see them power something, um, which is when it really, I think like, oh, wow, I can build this because I know how to write HTML. I know how to write Python or whatever. And now I know how to store data in a database. Um, so I think that'll be really cool. Um, I've shown it a couple of times because we, we've always done a couple of projects. So, uh, but this, this one obviously changed, but I'm hoping to kind of have an example project. It may not be as big as what the final is, but like, I'm going to draw a wireframe with all this stuff and link it just like you guys' final project. So you can kind of see it. Um, but does anyone have any questions about like any of this that we did today? Um, I know we like didn't focus in on one thing, but I'm hoping this also helps anyone who hasn't started their final project that maybe wants to. It's pretty quiet. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and and I like uh, I guess just as general feedback. Uh, do you guys feel like the the course has scaled well, like to this point, like? Uh, um like how how good of a grasp do you feel you have on on like what you just saw today like it, do you feel like as you, i was going along you understood like it was predictable like you could replicate it if if you gave it enough thought yeah perfect i Definitely. think the one change that i put on my comments on this class would be maybe to have the requirement to build a database but build it in pieces throughout the course so that your final is the product of your work. So, because hands-on learning is how a lot of people learn. And so doing this as part of the learning process would have been really awesome. Yeah, that's good feedback. And we've, we've talked about that because uh, um, that's one thing in the, uh, I mean, granted, it's uh, it was later, and I think it's still in the discussion. But one of the discussions is actually having the weekly paper be basically an update on what did you learn building your project. Uh, you know, have it broken out in phases, like you said. What did you learn? Uh, what would you do different? Uh, those kind of things. Um, so, so yeah, that is very good feedback, and I'm glad to hear because honestly, uh, I'll be honest, the old curriculum it did not scale extremely well. Um, it, it kind of threw you in the deep end of the pool. Um, granted at the end of the course, like we ended on a much higher level, um, cause we were actually doing this type stuff in week two, believe it or not. Um, but so this one scales a lot better. Um, but we ended on a higher level. Um, but that being said, um, I'm glad because I feel like this has been my, per, uh, my, from my perspective, I feel like everyone's had a much more firm grasp on, on the content because in the past, the students who took the time, I think they ended at a higher level, but not everyone with the, the distribution at skill level or understanding was, was all over the board. There was tons of variants. Um, but this term, I feel like almost everybody's on the same page and there it's all nice, good foundation. So I hope and, that's true. And I'll be honest. I, I did take the last uh, CIT 225 and uh, I was having such a difficult time that um, I, I had to withdraw from the class. And now that I've taken it over in this format, I, I really like this format. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the Me feedback too. we've kind of gotten. And 
And again, just want to thank you guys because this was term one and they kind of rushed this out, right? Um, in, in a way, uh, we kind of did a lot of, there were some people who did a lot of tremendous work to kind of get this out there quickly. So you guys could uh, take advantage of it. Because I think once they saw it, they're like, wow, this is going to be really good. Um, so that's why some of the quizzes have been messy. So just know that we appreciate all the help and the patience. Um, hopefully it hasn't been too terrible, but uh, I think uh, it was a net positive overall. So, Yeah, and I think the other thing is repetition. Um, so I feel like this class was a big repetition of CIT 111, but it's that repetition that you almost need when you're learning something like this to really cement, like I had the grasp of it last time, but I feel like I learned more and still understood it even better this time through. Perfect, that's good. That is good to know. Alrighty, yeah, I'm excited to see you guys' final projects. I think it'll be, that. that's honestly what I've been looking forward to the end of the this whole term is uh, the final projects. Cause I like to just kind of, you know, I, I like to see the creativity um, because the one downside to, to SQL versus some of the programming languages is um, in, in many cases, not that there's not more than one way, but uh, in most cases, like everyone's going to look the exact same, like the, with more complex problems, there's more ways, but for the most part, everyone's code looks the same, um, which is fine. That's the kind of the way it's supposed to be, but I'm excited to see like uh, your projects, your creativity, um, cause that's really where, where I think it'll be, like you said, I'm, I'm a, I'm a hands-on learner. And so even when, like when I'm doing, uh, when I did my master's, even now, like switching to a new job, I'm doing something like, I just go crazy. Just, um, like, cause I do statistical stuff, uh, data analysis. So I build all sorts of stuff and I know like only 1% of it's going to be actually usable, but, uh, that's just the best way. So I, th I think the final project you'll will be really, if you haven't already started uh, towards the end, it'll just be a good experience and hopefully cement some confidence. Uh, so when you actually go start applying for jobs, you can, you know, and I would keep it as a, in, in your, under your belt in case you ever need like, Hey, you know, this is a portfolio I did or um, whatever. So anyways, uh, I don't want to take any more of you guys' time. So uh something really quick to me sure so like um unique um let me go back to the chapter here real fast um give me just a second to fast forward because i was getting confused on like Oh, okay, here we go. Ah, I just passed it. Okay. So you it talked about um you would you would want something that has like it showed the table for like multiple names. So it split the alphabet in half and then it took that alphabet and it split it into like four different levels and then so it kind of broke it down in bite-sized pieces. And so while that is unique, it's not unique because, I mean, unique in that everything is different. I don't know. I, I'm just kind of confused about the concept of it. Well, let me put it this way. Um, do you understand like select distinct? Yes. Okay. So it only pulls one of everything. Yeah. You know, so if I have like, uh if i have um what's a good example like let's say i'm pulling uh let's say this is a table that holds all these transactions right like let's say i'm taking all of the storage transactions and i want to say what were the various types of credit cards used today you know i would select distinct credit card type from transactions and i would only maybe get three rows versus a million right, right. because um, it's only pulling uh, distinct values or unique values so it goes through all and says, okay, what are the unique values in here for, for credit card type? Okay, it's Visa, MasterCard, and Discover Card. Boom, there's your distinct values. Well, if we were going to build a credit card table, let's say credit card type, just like our example here, credit card type. 
Um, uh, let's just say card type ID. So we're going to say an int primary key um, auto increment. So under that same concept of understanding, if we have a name and let's say our name is Visa, MasterCard, so on and so forth. Um, and let's say that it can be 60 characters and it's not all. So, so right, this is the table that's essentially going to feed that transaction data. Well, let's say we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't have two different versions of Visa, right? Because let's say that someone's setting up this and they could do, let's say they first set it up for Visa. Let's say someone else sets it up for Visa. Let's say someone does it like this. Let's say someone really fat fingers it and does something like that. So you can see now that we have like an, four different distinct values. Um, and what we want to do is make sure that that can't happen because really the way this is going to work is they're going to say, these are the credit card types we accept. Um, so let's, in fact, let's add an accepted. Um, and it's going to be a tiny int like we talked about. Um, default is, we're going to say not null, default one. Um, but we want to make sure, so let's, uh, let's leave this constraint off for now. So we're just going to build our table. Here it is. Um, and let's do an insert in here. So let's say the first person now, obviously this would probably be done through a web interface, but we're going to say insert into credit card type. Um, we're going to say uh, name. We're just going to do name. So th this is where people can essentially build um, additional like what credit card types do we accept? Just like imagine if you're setting up a like WordPress or an online store, right? Because they all would do something like this. So let's say the first person goes in there and says, oh, we accept Visa. All right, so they run it and Visa's in there and all of a sudden people can make transactions with Visa. Well, let's say someone else goes in there and says, oh, like I'm going to add one for Visa. Right, now both of those exist credit card type. And when people go to use, and they're both accepted. So when people go to use their card or when they go to buy something and they go to check out, now they have to choose from visa all lowercase or visa all uppercase, so on and so forth. Um, and what's more important is that we can have it, uh, we can have two of the same type. So let's say someone just says, oh, like add visa to our list, you know, whatever it happens. So now we select uh, everything from credit card type, and now we have multiple of the same thing. So what we can do is we can add um, constraints, and specifically, we're going to add a unique constraint onto name. So we're going to say constraint uh, card type UK1 unique on name. So now with this, if I were to, uh, we got to drop this table. So now if I were to create this table and run this and run this, it's not going to let us. And the important thing is, is we're maintaining our integrity, meaning, hey, you already have a visa in there. Um, you can't do it again. Um, so on and so forth. Now we could actually go a bit further to say, hey, um, when they insert this, make it all uppercase and check case insensitive that this, this doesn't exist, um, so to speak. So there's lots of things you can do. Um, and in fact, one that I forgot to touch on is uh, a check constraint. So like, let's say we want to do a check constraint card type, um, check one, and we're going to say check. And we're going to say, uh, We're going to say check that accepted is in one zero. And what's the one zero? And can MySQL do oh, check? Oh, sure. those are the two options they can choose. Uh, what did that? Did that not work? Did that? Oh, let's see if we drop this and create it. 
Uh, for some reason, it doesn't like that. Anyways, well, you can do check. Don't you have, don't you, uh, well, accepted in, I thought you had to declare the field after the, Oh, no, you can't. Uh, wait, yes, a tiny integer, one zero. It should, it should take it. That's bizarre. Yeah, I'm missing something. And I did it kind of fast, and I'm used to other formats. But anyways, like, you, know, you can do a check constraint to basically say, hey, make sure that accepted is either a one or a zero. Oh. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of things you can do um, to essentially uh, do, do integrity. Um, because really, like you want, uh, you want to take as much out of the clientele's hands as possible. Um, you don't want to give them a way to have an error. You know, we have to account for human mistakes. So, so like uh, if we were, if we were having a, uh, let me take this out real quick. If we were uh, building this, you know, we would want a Visa in there. We would want Mastercard. You know, let's say that these are all basically when when people go to check out they'll actually run this select statement here accepted is equal to one you know they're going to run this select statement here and it's going to pull the values so it's going to pull in fact like one and i'll show you this when we actually build um it's going to select the card type id and the name because for a html selects uh select item where it's a drop down menu um, like, let's say you make them choose what kind of card it is. Um, you know, they'll see in the list Visa or MasterCard, but really it's the one or two that matters because when they go to do your insert, so then if we were to say insert into transaction, blah, 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 you know, our credit card type ID would be would be whatever they selected. So like, let's say they have a visa, you know, we would insert that there is a, is an integer. So, you know, as far as transactions, they can only choose these ones, but what we also want the unique constraint for is to make sure that only one visa exists, if that makes sense. Because, you know, you can imagine how messy it could get. Oh, you know what I know? Go ahead, Bradley. I, I know what your issue was. It was when you did the when you did a constraint with check. I th think that you had an outer parenthesis missing. Oh, and I wondered because it was kind of like running multiple statements in the same thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Anyway. Um. So it's like it. It needs to be unique, but it can also have like I think the book had the example of like John Smith and. Jerry Smith and Susie Smith. And so they were all different, but they were all the same too. Yeah. And you want to, uh, yeah. And, and that just depends on your logic. And sometimes like, let's say you only want one version of first and last name, like for, uh, for people databases, a lot of times they'll put, uh, or for people records, like let's say names, like if you want to uniquely identify a person, that might be first name, last name, and birth date. Um, you know, because it is it is possible that there could be multiple of those, but in a lot of cases, it's not. And so, it just depends on how restrictive you want to be. Because um, obviously, we could skip putting all these constraints on, and things would still technically work. Um, but they're also easy to break. So the more constraints you have, the easier. And more trustworthy, the more reliable your database and your data is going to be. Right. So a B tree index works best with columns that have unique data. Yep, and and a lot of that's because, like, if if it's indexed, like, let's say I'm, let's say you're Facebook and you're looking for, uh, you know, you log in with your new username, right? So let's say you log in with your email, so. They're saying, hey, I need to find the user whose email is is X, right? And only one person can have that email at a time or else that would be really weird. Um, so what they do is, is if it's unique indexed, basically, A, it's alphabetized. So uh, the database engine is going to go to the closest index point 
to, to find your email address. And the nice thing is, is once it finds your email address, it knows it's the only one there. So it can stop looking the minute it finds it. Does that make sense? Because otherwise it has to look through every possibility. But right. one, if it's unique, once it finds it, it says, okay, I'm done. Okay. That makes more sense because that's where I was getting confused because it was like it was unique, but it wasn't unique. And so it's like there had to be a unique piece within there, but it wasn't unique. And the fact that like primary key is unique. Yes. So that's what was throwing me off. Yep. And you can have a unique key be a composite key. So for example, in this case, I said, hey, you know, I want multiple numbers to exist, but I don't want multiple numbers in a given catalog. So I want the composite number and catalog to be unique, if that makes sense. So like, uh, for example, like if we were going back to the name situation, you know, I can have a John Smith, a John Henry, but I can't have John Smith, John Smith. If we have first and last name. So, so uh, you can also have composite keys is what they're called. Composite indexes. Mm -hmm. I think the example they used in the book was John Smith. And then they had um, like unique constraint on the email address. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, I won't uh, keep rambling on anymore. Uh, is there any other questions? No. Nope. Um, for me the other drop. one that was throwing hey, me sounds off sounds good bradley thanks um so it said we find my spot here in the book i have everything highlighted in yellow <laughs> oh let's see it must be down here a little farther Because it was talking about every time it updates the database, as rows are inserted, updated, and deleted from the customer table, the server will attempt to keep the tree balanced so that there aren't far more branch or leaf nodes on one side of the root than on the other. So, okay, so that does cause more, okay. Yeah, because you can imagine like if it's, indexing like a column um you know and it has like different methods of getting to that information depending on you know your different constraints or indexes um you know basically every time that data changes it kind of has to do some work um so basically i think what that's saying is like hey you know it's going to um it's going to try and keep everything balanced meaning like let's say that like, let's go back to like, let's say you have a unique email and let's say, and this is deep engine stuff. So like, I don't, I don't exactly know how this works, but let's say that it, it alphabetizes based on the email address is one of the ways that it can find things quicker. Um, but let's say all of a sudden we end up with emails that uh, are very heavy in certain areas because it'll segment it out, right? So it'll say like, uh, maybe alphabet's not a good one. Let's use numbers. Right. So let's say uh, let's say you index based on an ID column um, or like a state code that's that's an integer column. Um, it's going to try to segment out numbers into equal slices. Right. So you can imagine like let's say you have a whole data set full of numbers, um, but you sort them as far as uh, where they are at in in order from least to greatest. And let's say that you then split that into quadrants so four pieces and then then that way you can say hey is this number between quadrant one or two quadrant uh is it in quadrant one is it in quadrant two is it in quadrant three or quadrant four and then wherever it exists you can start in that quadrant um and so but let's say all of a sudden you delete a bunch of data and all of a sudden your quadrants are no longer equal um basically the engine is going to try to compensate for that it's going to keep updating quadrants as necessary to um, make it so it's still fast. Cause you can imagine, let's say 
initially when you set up that index, um, it was equally distributed amongst quadrants. But then let's say you delete some and all of a sudden quadrant one, two, and three are empty, but quadrant four has double the amount. You know, that would be a problem because then you're not saving any performance. It's still starting with all the rows in quadrant four. So when you do uh, certain uh, constraints, certain indexes, it's going to constantly reevaluate and and make and be smarter. That's like where a lot of that secret mm -hmm. magical stuff is that makes it fast. Okay. I think what threw me off is that the server will attempt to keep the tree balanced. And I wasn't equating that with the index. So I just was I was just confused. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. It's it, and that stuff, SQL tuning, performance and tuning is very much uh, uh, top tier stuff. Cause like, you know, learning how it works is like one thing um, to be able to tune it. You have to understand how it works uh, pretty intimately um, to be able to say like, Hey, you know, if, if we index this column, we're going to save a bunch of time because of X, Y, and Z, you know, like that's a, a more advanced uh, skill set. So um, it's important to know why we do indexing. Um, but, you know, it's a, uh, you, you don't feel bad if you don't understand how it works. <laughs> and do we need to have an index in our final? You know, if you want to throw one in, that's fine. Um, they're due so soon, you're not going to be docked anything if they don't have an index. Okay. Because that's my goal this week is the query piece. So. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, and I don't think you'll have any performance issues without indexes. So, okay. <laughs> yep, wonderful. All righty. Thank you, Brother Crick. You have yep. a wonderful evening. And yep. Weekend. Same to you. Thanks for all the comments and questions and interaction. It helps make this a lot good. A lot, a lot good. Helps make it a lot better for everyone who watches <laughs> later. So, uh, so thank you, and have a have a good good week. Thank you. Bye.